Welcome back to the Dino Bidala Show. Right now, so happy to have back on our friend Glenn Kirshner, former 30-year federal prosecutor, served in the U.S. Army in JAG Corps. You see him on MSNBC and NBC as a legal analyst, YouTube channel Justice Matters with Glenn Kirshner, and co-cruise director with Frank Figlusi, because Frank was on a few <laughs> days ago. Frank talking books, a cruise. There's going to be shirts. There's going to be dinner with Frank. When you go on that cruise, you got to have some merch, Glenn, because Frank's got a lot. He's got his book. He's going to do a book reading, he told me. So, Dean, Dean, I'm I'm not hawking anything. I am not a cruise salesman. But but the fact of the matter is, if you care about justice and the rule of law and accountability, and you want to go on a justice centric cruise to the Mediterranean, you know, come cruise with Frank and I. I think that's great. I think I think it's so funny because it's selling and people are coming. But Frank's got a lot of stuff to sell. So let's. So there's a lot of legal decisions going on. First of all, before we get into what Jack Smith's response was on Tuesday, that got a lot of headlines. What led up to that? What did Judge Cannon ask Jack Smith and Trump's lawyers to do that is precipitated really a, a really tense, terse and tense filing by Jack Smith? Yeah, it's kind of legal insanity. So Judge Cannon said, I'm going to propose two jury instructions and I want you all to, quote, engage her word with these jury instructions. A couple of things about jury instructions, Dean. Ordinarily, you don't even begin talking about jury instructions until you're virtually on the eve of trial or you are in trial. And Judge Cannon has steadfastly refused to even set a trial date. So why in the world we're talking about jury instructions now is beyond this old prosecutor. Frankly, you can't even finalize jury instructions until you've seen all of the evidence that has been admitted during the course of the trial. Then you go about deciding what jury instructions apply to the evidence. So the whole thing was pretty curious. And the two jury instructions were not really jury instructions. They weren't accurate reflections of the law. What they said in substance is, when you're president, they let you do it. They let you take all of the records you want that contain classified information, that include military attack plans on foreign countries, that include our nuclear capabilities. The president can take them all and convert them into personal records, like a diary, a journal, journal, or your own personal medical records. And she wanted to instruct the jury have a right to even weigh in on that determination. In a very real sense, Dean, and I've seen a lot of jury instructions in my time, this was Judge Cannon wanting to instruct the jury that basically they must find Donald Trump not guilty on this harebrained notion that somehow the Presidential Records Act has anything to do with our nation's espionage laws, which it doesn't. Jack Smith told Judge Cannon that she was off her rocker in very direct and searing terms, more politely than I've just stated it. But here is what he said flat out. Judge, your legal premise is wrong. And a jury instruction for the Espionage Act charges that reflect that premise would distort the trial and would essentially guarantee a failed prosecution. And if you do it, we're going to appeal you. And if you don't do it, you don't render a decision, we're going to mandamus you, which is a fancy appeal that uh, uh, when a prosecutor seeks an appellate court to tell a trial court judge, do your job and do it in accordance with the law and don't abuse your discretion. This is like we're living in the legal upside down in Judge Cannon's courtroom. You know, last month when we spoke, Judge Cannon is before this, this Judge Cannon asked for these weird jury instructions or alarming. There was something else where she did was almost was reasonable. And I said, you think she's doing a rope -a dope And she was doing a rope -a dope And you like the boxing reference because of Muhammad Ali did rope -a dope famously in a famous fight. And here's where we are now. On some level, Glenn, it seems like she's rewriting the Presidential Records Act. It was passed in 1978 to say a president can't just go, I'm taking everything with me. It's a, the only thing you could take your personal records. If if her interpretation was correct, then the Presidential Records Act has been rewritten to be the opposite. Every, take whatever you want. Anything, take whatever you want. Take our nation's most prized secrets. Take nuclear weapons, capability, weapon development, and you could take it all home and do whatever you want with it. And this is insane. And Dean, what I love is on page four, um, of, of this new Jack Smith filing, he says, and wait a minute, Judge, Trump has never once asserted that he even 
tried to convert any records, presidential records, to personal records. In fact, he's been given every opportunity. He's never said it in a motion. His lawyers have never said it in court. I mean, this really is a bit of legal insanity because we're trying to answer hypotheticals when the facts themselves will not support a conclusion that Donald Trump has any defense here. I'm chatting with Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, the, Glenn obviously now, she, the, you know, we could see an appeal, a uh, writ of mandamus. I guess, I don't know, is it by right? Could, will it, do they by right the state or the government in this case can make a, a motion to the uh, appellate court as opposed to waiting the whole trial is over? So, no, I mean, the, the prosecution doesn't get to wait until the trial's over. The prosecution's appellate rights are very, very, very limited. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if Judge Cannon made a case dispositive ruling before the jury was ever sworn, before the trial ever started, she threw out all the evidence and granted a motion to dismiss the indictment, that would be appealable. But once a jury is sworn and jeopardy attaches, then the, the prosecution gets to appeal almost nothing. All of the appellate rights, you know, live with the defendant. So the, the, the writ of mandamus is an extraordinary writ. And basically it's when a trial court judge is acting in a lawless manner, which we've seen Judge Cannon do before. Mm -hmm. And the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals found that she abused her discretion in favor of Donald Trump and reversed her rulings. So it looks like she is headed in that direction again. And if she goes there... Then I think Judge, uh, then I think Jack Smith files a petition for a writ of mandamus asking the appellate court to order her to reverse and do her job in accordance with the law. At this point, can they even trust her? I mean, everyone's asked the same question about your recusal. And when you, if, does Jack, just so people understand, let's start at 10, you know, recusal 101. Can the government make a motion for recusal? Is it too late? Are they still able to? And if they are, what's the standard? It is not too late. It's never too late because any new act by a judge that may show that the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned, which is the exact language of the federal statute requiring a judge to remove themselves, recuse themselves from a case. So it's always sort of a present day concern based on what the judge is doing or, or refusing to do. So I think the disqualification bucket is now overflowing, right? There have been so many bad rulings by Judge Cannon, and this one really is the most dramatic when she wants to propose jury instructions that are contrary to the law that would direct the jury to find Donald Trump not guilty. Uh, at some point, Dean, I hope Jack Smith says, okay, the recusal bucket, the disqualification bucket is full and overflowing, and we have to file the motion win, lose or draw. Let's file it. Let's litigate it in the full light of day. And let's let the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals make a decision. But the standard, I would contend the the standard in the law for a judge having to remove themselves or being removed if they won't is fairly low. If a judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned, don't tell me there's anybody who can't reasonably question her impartiality. If Donald Trump wins a conviction in this case, it will not be a reliable result because we will say the fix has been in since day one with Judge Cannon presiding. We know this. And that is what the recusal law was designed to prevent, undermining the public's confidence in the results. You said conviction, you meant acquittal. If Donald Trump gets an acquittal, then no one's going to believe conviction. it. Yeah, well, no, I'm no, a prosecutor, I understand. So I hear a prosecutor. I'm Everything's a conviction, conviction to Glenn Kirshner. <laughs> so, Glenn, look at the the big. Let's take a step back. To me, Judge Cannon is trying to help Donald Trump. She's only forty three. In her mind, if Donald Trump wins, she's auditioning for him. He will put her on the U.S. Court of Appeals, if not the Supreme Court. So, just delaying this is the big win he wants. So, say there has to be a writ of mandamus filed, and there's a recusal motion. In all likelihood, are we now beyond? November beyond the election. And that's all Trump wanted. And that's what that Cannon's giving him. Yeah, I think it's very unlikely that the classified documents, obstruction of justice, espionage trial in Florida gets tried to completion before the election. I think the New York trial, and I'm sure we'll talk about that yeah. in a few minutes, will be resolved. I think there's still at least a, a realistic possibility that the D.C. federal prosecution for trying to overturn the presidential election 
can go to trial and be resolved prior to November. I think the documents case is it, it, it's almost a dead case, given the way not not dead in the long term, but in the short term, given Judge Cannon's determination to keep this thing on the slowest possible track. It's it's very frustrating to watch what we see with Trump flaunting the system because he has a lot of money being able to game the system and it affects people's confidence in the entire system and the integrity of the system and a bigger picture thing. is something we talked about on my show. So let's talk about, we're going to get to the New York case. I want to talk about that for a little bit at length, but in Georgia, Trump's lawyers had made a motion with some of the co-defendants to dismiss the case based on the Rico case, based on the fact that Trump was just exercising his first amendment rights when he was pressuring people to find votes. And the judge just this afternoon wrote, nope, even core political speech addressing matters of public concern, they're not impenetrable from prosecution, but allegedly used to further criminal activity and saying what was made there based on the allegations. Willful and knowing misstatements are are completely actionable here. A- any yep. surprise from your point of view? No, it would be like, Dean, if you and I were entering into an agreement to rob a bank. Hey, Dean, you get the gun. I'll steal the car. There's the bank. Let's case the joint. Let's go do it. OK, boom. And then you and I walk in the court after we've been arrested and indicted and say, whoa, 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 First Amendment rights. I were just talking. You have no right to use those words against us. The answer is, yeah, we do, because they were part and parcel of criminal conduct. And Judge McAfee made that pretty clear. No surprises here. Yeah. And the idea that if you're an elected official, that you could somehow your words can't be used against you is laughable because then any politician could do anything with kickbacks and say, Hey, you know, I'm calling for my office. Just, you know, I'll give you that contract. Just make sure you give me my, some money kickback and first amendment. Don't worry. No, no one can ever get me. And the response to that is, what do you think you are a member of Congress? So you can, you know, (laughs) speech and speech or debate clause will protect your work. Well, yeah, well, it kind of does protect their criminal words, but not Donald Trump's. And that's vitally important. Again, that case, I would imagine it's actually more fair in a way that that trial probably won't happen before Election Day. But that's not because of the judge in this case or or the prosecutor. This is a complex case with numerous defendants in RICO charges as well. But do you think there's any chance that begins before Election Day or no? So there's a chance, but not with all 15 remaining RICO defendants. 19 were indicted, four pleaded guilty and are cooperating and expected to testify. I had a big RICO case in D.C. with about the same number of defendants. We had 13 at the end of the day that we had to take the trial. We did it in three separate RICO trials, three waves of trials. So I say that because you could easily put Donald Trump and a couple of co-conspirators, co-defendants in wave one. And that could be set for trial in September. So yes, the answer is, It can be done. Do I think it will be done? I think it's unlikely. So let's turn our attention to the election fraud case here in New York before Judge Marshawn. The media calls the hush money case. It really is uh, election interference, election fraud. That's what was really going on. Before we talk about the merits of the case a little bit in the trial date, what's your reaction to the former prosecutor, Donald Trump, attacking by name the judge's daughter and even sharing uh, links with pictures to her? What, What was his goal from your point of view? I don't know if his goal is to be held in contempt so he can then use that as a fundraising vehicle. It may very well be because it looks like he again yesterday reposted uh, something about something that was posted by somebody else Mm -hmm. about the judge's daughter and, you know, that and the judge's wife, I believe. So it's clearly out of bounds. It's clearly in violation of the expanded gag order that Judge Mershon issued just days ago. I can only conclude that Donald Trump either can't help himself or wants to be held in contempt. So let's give him what he wants. The New York state law says if you intentionally violate a a lawful court order, which this gag order is, you can be fined a thousand dollars, whoop de doo for Donald Trump, or you can be jailed for up to 30 days. I think we start giving him 30 day stints one after another. Each time, you know, listen, I think he should be in pretrial detention because he's a danger to the community and the law provides if there's clear and convincing evidence that you're a danger to to the community and you're on pretrial release in a felony case, he's on pretrial release in four. The law provides that you should be detained pending trial. No judge has been willing to do that. No prosecutor has been willing to ask for it. But you know what? Let's 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 take what we can get. And I think he is now subject to a series of 30 day 
criminal contempt convictions. And, you know, let's see if that has an impact on him sitting his butt in a jail cell in an orange jumpsuit for 30 days at a time. Should the fact that Donald Trump wants that to become a victim and raise money be in the judge's mind? Should it at all impact that Trump supporters might engage in violence to as vigilantes to protect their Donald Trump? Should a judge compare about any of that or is it simply the administration of justice here? The day prosecutors and judges begin making decisions, prosecutorial decisions or judicial decisions based on how uninvolved folks might react to those decisions is the day we have lost it all. It's the day that the criminal justice system is no longer operating in a way that will protect the community in the long run or that we can have confidence in. When I was a prosecutor, I made prosecutorial decisions every day and I knew I was gonna piss somebody off on one side or the other. So it was very liberating. I know people are gonna be angry whether I charge or decline to charge. So I'm just gonna make my decisions based on the facts and the law, not how others might react when I made a fact and law-based decision. And I'm chatting with Glenn Kirshner, our friend, former 30 year prosecutor. So Glenn, we look at this case right now as the April 15th trial date. Donald Trump keeps making different motions, claiming he has to be put off because of pre-trial publicity, which is laughable because he's the one that caused it. But we want more based on your experience. What more should we expect the defense attorneys on behalf of Donald Trump to say between now and even on April 15th when they report for trial to try to put this off? So three things to keep an eye out for. One, he will continue to file frivolous motions like the one that Judge Mershon just denied. Mm -hmm. You know, 17 days before the trial, he said, I want to raise a presidential immunity motion. And the judge is like, well, let's look at the New York law. You had 45 days from the date you were arraigned. You were arraigned on April 4th, 2023. So by May 19, 2023, you were done filing motions. And by the way, you filed that motion here and here and here and here and here in the D.C. case. You have raised it in the removal case when you were trying to get this prosecution taken from state court, put in the federal court. So it's not like you didn't know about it. So Judge Mershon very politely said, I question your tactics here. I don't question his tactics. He was trying to delay the trial. So there will be one more frivolous motions made. Two, he may try to appeal the denial of the presidential immunity motion, but it shouldn't be subject to an appeal at this point. But he'll try and he'll try it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and then three, maybe look for uh, him to try to fire his defense attorneys on the eve of trial, walk into court and say, oh, judge would love to go to trial, but I need to hire new defense attorneys and they're going to need six months to gear up. Um, I've had that happen plenty of times when defendants realized they had run out of delay rope and they tried that tactic. And here's the thing. The defense attorney would move to withdraw as counsel and the judge would deny the motion to withdraw and order the attorney to go to trial. Any disputes you have are between attorney and, and client. We have a trial date. We're going to trial. So I think that's the way Judge Mershon would respond to that delay tactic. Yeah, because when you're a criminal defense attorney and you have this trial date, my understanding is you, you need leave of the court to mm -hmm. be able to leave the case as an attorney, meaning you have to ask for permission. What about Donald Trump showing up in a bathrobe like the former mobsters here in New York and saying there's something wrong with him and starts, you know, eating a hamburger that's stored in his hair or something like that? Anything along that those lines? man, I, who knows what's stored in that man's hair? <laughs> that man's vanity will not permit him to do it. He will, I believe he will never feign incompetence. He will never feign some sort of mental condition that would make it difficult for him to be found competent to go to trial because he cares too much about himself and how he's perceived. And that's all he cares about. So he, I do not think he will pull the bathrobe tactic. Right. I think that was Gigante. Was that the guy in New York? I can't remember the guy in New York that was, we had a mobster in New York who famously would wander around the neighborhoods wearing a bathrobe. And it was the idea that he was criminally, he was legally insane or something, but he was still running the mafia and he, and he wasn't. So how concerned are you? Because the analogy to Donald Trump and the Teflon Don and John Gotti, John Gotti tampered with a witness. There were charges arising from that in one of the trials. How concerned are you that Donald Trump 
even if not directly, just one of his supporters trying to help him offers money to a juror, threatens a juror, somehow finds their identity and does something. Yeah, in a big RICO case that I tried, actually two I tried, we had anonymous juries because we were afraid that the defendants were going to get after the jurors and they still ended up getting after the jurors. It was interesting. Here's a, here's a quick story which mm -hmm. may play itself out in New York. So the criminal organization that we were trying in this RICO case would bring all of their friends and the criminal associates who weren't charged in the case and they would pack the audience and they would look at the jurors and they would be like, ah, that's the mailman in my neighborhood or that I know that person, even though the name was never revealed because they were anonymous and then they would get after them and they would intimidate them and those jurors would have to be removed and we would have to substitute alternates who had been in, in place. You know, we had six mm -hmm. or eight or 10 alternates to account for this eventuality. Let's see if Donald Trump tries to pull that kind of nonsense. Um, but I am concerned about selecting jurors who can be fair and impartial and decide the case based only on the evidence they see introduced during the course of the trial and not on their any of their preconceived notions, their political affiliation or ideology, their knowledge of the case. You can know about a case and most sure. people will know something about a case. You have to swear under oath that you can put it aside, put it out of your mind and decide the case based only on the evidence. I think the I think the parties, I think the prosecution is up to the task of selecting a fair, impartial, and unbiased jury. So I think it's actually pretty hard for a mole to sneak on the jury, hiding all of their preferences and proclivities and, and associations. Um, it could happen, but I, I am a big believer in once we are in a court and the rules of law and the rules of evidence apply, which they don't apply in the court of public opinion. That's why we have Donald Trump spouting all kinds of nonsense about, I'm allowed to do this, I'm allowed to do that. Well, no, you're not. And you're not even allowed to make those arguments in court, Dean. People should know. They're not going to be permitted to make arguments that are either um, without factual support, contrary to the law. And so once they're put on a very tight leash with respect to what they can and can't do in trial, the evidence is going to crush Donald Trump in all four prosecutions, it's just, you know, a matter of making sure we get a fair and impartial jury. I've always said you can't win a case in jury selection, but you can lose a case in jury selection. Interesting. And I just want to touch on here in the last few minutes. You mentioned anonymous juries. So just so people understand, just literally logistically, it's not like the jurors are in another room watching the trial or their faces are they're not wearing a mask or something like that. People could still see them. It's just that their names and where they live is not given out to the public. And is it given to Trump's team? Because I saw in that last motion, the judge said about he could forfeit his statutory right to have the names and addresses of the jurors, depending on what he does. Different jurisdictions handle it differently. In federal court, when we had an anonymous jury impaneled, two of them, um, we weren't even given the names and the defense attorneys weren't given the names. Wow. Um, in, in New York, in the current criminal prosecution, um, the judge decided that they would be anonymous to the extent that their names would not be released publicly, but the attorneys will be given their names, the prosecutors and the defense attorneys. And if they violate some of the restrictions being put on that information that the judge has deigned to give them, then it could be revoked. They could be sanctioned. So, um, but no, yeah, they're going to have the names and let's hope they don't abuse the um, the privilege of having those names. I assume they want the names because they probably want to go scorched earth on social media, figuring out, are these people really what they are purporting to be during jury selection? Or might someone be a mole? Because if you go in there and you say, I have no political views or concerns or affiliations or strong feelings, and then you go online and this person is like, you know, F that Donald Trump or F that prosecutor. I love that Donald Trump. Well, now you have been trying to hide your own biases and preferences. So now you're not being straight with the court. And we got to kick you off as being unfit to serve. But but the reality is, too, that since Donald Trump's lawyers will have the name, Trump will have the name and they will search the person and they find nothing there. But later, if Trump gets convicted, he'll find a family member who donated money to a Democrat somewhere and, and the good news is, Dean, 
And the good news is, I don't mean to interrupt you, sure. you cannot impeach a verdict. In other words, undercut or negate a jury verdict with something like that that you find after the fact. The sanctity, um, right. it, we call it piercing the veil. You can't pierce the veil of, of jury secrecy or of the verdict the jury returns based on that extraneous stuff. The only reason you can do it is if there was outside influence that made its way into the jury during deliberations. Well, you're thinking like a lawyer. I'm thinking of like Donald Trump, the sinister political person who will say that to his base. And that'll become a talking point. The jury was rigged. We know that no matter what the verdict is, they will find someone on that jury somewhere who's got a family member or a cousin, somebody who works right. somewhere for a Democrat and will say it was rigged. And for his base, that'll be enough. Because it doesn't matter. Like we're, Glenn, as you know, we are not dealing with uh, a normal political relationship between a leader and a base. We are dealing with uh, the, the the love and obsession of an authoritarian or a fascist leader through his, academically through his history. So whatever he says, it's about people in the middle. Very last thing I had to get your reaction here. You know, the Michigan Police Officers Association in Michigan just endorsed Donald Trump. And these are the Michigan Police Officers Association. You have friends. I've met your friends, Harry Dunn. Um, Others, Mike Fanone. Mike Fanone. I met Mike Fanone. Also, Daniel Hodges, Capitol Police officers who were brutally beaten up by Donald Trump's January 6th terrorists, who Donald Trump has pledged to pardon. What is your reaction to hear Donald Trump getting the endorsement of a police department after what Trump has done and pledged to do in the future? I don't understand how, when police officers know Donald Trump launched an attack on the Capitol that damn near took the life of, of more than 100 police officers. People were beaten brutally. Mike Fanon, Aquilino Gonell, Harry Dunn, Caroline Edwards, um, Daniel Hodges, and so many others. And then Donald Trump said these people who have been convicted for assaulting police officers, they're hostages, they're de facto heroes, and I will pardon them. I will excuse the assaults that they perpetrated on the police officers who were protecting the Capitol that day, how anybody in blue can support Donald Trump. It's such a searing disrespect and disregard for the 140 some odd police officers who were attacked that day. I don't understand how any officer would be that gullible, would be that blind to the realities of who Donald Trump is and what he is, what he is doing or would be that stupid because the officers that I worked with from a dozen different police departments in Washington, DC, none of them were that blind, that stupid, um, or that callous to excuse assaults on their fellow brothers and sisters in blue. So I don't get it. It's despicable. It is despicable. And these police officers in Michigan uh, should if any defendant gets charged with crime, they, they can maybe even use it against them to impeach them. Like, you're, you're doing this to me, but you're okay when Trump does assault on a police officer. Unbelievable. Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. Again, the YouTube channel, Justice Matters with Glenn Kirshen. I just retweeted, re x whatever it's called, um, two of your most recent monologues. They're great stuff on some things that we discussed here. Have a great weekend, brother. It's a great chatting with you.